Good morning, Orlando. This is Orlando's news, weather, and traffic here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. Filling in for Bud, this is Yappy. And I'm Deborah Roberts. And our top stories this morning the Trump Putin meeting is taking place today, and 11 are rescued from a capsized boat at an air show. We'll have the details coming up in one minute. Yes, and as Deb said, the big story is the Trump Putin summit. My question for you will anything good come from this summit? We'll talk about that next. And good Monday morning. It's 6.01 on News Radio 1025. President Trump meets with Russian leader Vladimir Putin today in Helsinki. In fact, just moments away, he was asked about the sit down during a working breakfast with the Finnish president this morning and remarked that it will, quote, be just fine, end quote. Trump on Twitter this morning complained that, quote, our relationship with Russia has never been worse thanks to many years of U.S. foolishness and stupidity and now the rigged witch hunt, end quote. His meeting uh, with Putin follows word on Friday of new indictments in the Russia probe. A dozen Russian intelligence agents are accused of hacking the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. However, they are not expected to be extradited to the U.S. This news brought to you by Tresco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. And it looks like Putin has just arrived in Finland. His plane just landed. So uh, I believe it's scheduled for them to meet in about 15, 20 minutes. I do. And I, I heard that there is going to be a live press conference when that meeting happens. Oh, when the meeting happens. I, I believe because I've okay. been uh, we've been listening and waiting for word because they're saying at six o'clock this morning, the president was going to be holding a press conference. Oh, OK. Well, we'll, we'll monitor the latest. On and, that. and we will as well. Make sure you're up on the latest. <laughs> All right. In the meantime, Mike, the U.S. is talking with North Korea to return the remains of thousands of U.S. soldiers who went missing during the Korean War. The two sides held talks on the issue this weekend at the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. The North promised to return the remains during the June 12th summit between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. and the North agreed to resume searches for the remains of the missing Americans. Out west in other news, a wildfire burning near Yosemite National Park in California has unfortunately killed a man who was helping to fight it. Cal Fire says Braden Varney died while battling the Ferguson fire Saturday. Varney was a heavy equipment operator whose bulldozer rolled over and steep terrain west of Yosemite. So far, that fire has burned over 4,000 acres and is only 2% contained. It's threatening over 100 buildings in the area. It's also shut down State Route 140, which is a key route into the National Park. A British cave diver says he has not ruled out legal action against billionaire Elon Musk after the SpaceX CEO called him a pedo on Twitter. Vernon Unsworth helped rescue that Thai youth soccer team trapped in a cave, a story that, of course, captured the world's attention. Well, Musk brought a mini-sub to the scene to help with the rescue, but it wasn't needed. Unsworth had said the sub was impractical and a PR stunt, and that Musk could stick his submarine where it hurts. Yeah, so it sounds like Musk took that a little personally. Yeah, because Musk responded by defending his sub and calling Unsworth suspicious and a pedophile. He was talking about in the ear, right? <laughs> yes, of course. Oh, okay. Putting the sub in the ear. That, that's yeah. his official defense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> provide exactly. to the court. But I believe he has uh, deleted that tweet. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's the it, internet. It, oh, of course. It stays forever. It stays but... <laughs> forever. And anyone, including Elon Musk, should know that. Yeah. <laughs> Back here in the Sunshine State, the Coast Guard and some good Samaritans are credited with saving a group whose boat capsized off Pensacola Beach. The incident happened Saturday afternoon during the Blue Angels Air Show. Eleven people on that boat wound up in the water after the boat tipped over, but the Coast Guard and other boaters nearby pulled everyone to safety. Thankfully, no one was hurt, and there's no word on what caused the boat to capsize. Closer to home, a 14-year-old Titusville girl is recovering from a possible shark bite. She suffered a large gash to her upper leg at Playa Linda Beach on Saturday afternoon and was airlifted to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital in Orlando. It wasn't immediately known if her injury was from a shark bite, a bite from another sea creature, or even from a surfboard. The teen was surfing for the very first time. I'm going to go on a limb here and guess it might be the last time. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. You can conquer your fears. There you go. That's true. Are you afraid of going in the ocean because of sharks? At I all? am not. I tried to conquer my fear of bungee jumping, uh, my fear of heights by bungee jumping twice. It didn't work. No. <laughs> nope. S still terrified of heights. Wow. Yeah, terrified. I, I. It's amazing that you did it twice. 
Yeah. You're like, well, the first time didn't work. I'll try again. Exactly. I think once would have been enough for me. You would think. (laughs) You would think. It got so bad that afterward, if I stayed in a hotel at a and stayed in a room with a balcony that was higher than 10 stories, I'd have to get on my hands and knees and crawl backwards. Oh, wow, really? Back into the room. That's how, yeah. This is after the bungee jumping? This was after the bungee jumping. So it just made it worse? It made it worse. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing like (laughs) falling by your ankles from 15 stories. All right. It's not as fun as it sounds. (laughs) And finally, today is Amazon Prime Day or Christmas in July. For Amazon Prime members, customers will have access to over 1 million deals. This year, the sale has been extended to a 36-hour period and will now reach global customers in four more countries. Technically, you do have to be an Amazon Prime subscriber to take advantage of the deals, but some vendors offer discounts to all shoppers, and there's also that loophole that allows free trial users access to the sale. Oh, okay. So So you never found anything on Amazon Prime Day? I think today I'm going to force myself. I'm going to sit there <laughs> and I'm going to keep looking until I find something I can spend my money needlessly on. So That's worthy goal. exactly what they're hoping for. Exactly. <laughs> Yay, commerce. Worthy goal. I it like is that. a worthy yes. goal. It is a Monday. Let's keep things slow and let's just go shopping. <laughs> Listen, that's just you being determined. Exactly. That's the kind of person you are. It's, you don't give up. I'm helping you're, the American economy. You're not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. Unless you ask me to bungee jump. (laughs) WFLA News Time at 6.07. Read about a U.S. official saying Russia is still using social media to divide America. At 1025WFLA.com, the first hour of Good Morning Orlando with Yaffe starts now. News, weather, and traffic for the best audience in talk radio. This is Good Morning Orlando on News Radio 1025. So it looks like Trump and Putin are going to meet very shortly. We'll have all the latest. My question for you is this. Will anything good come out of this summit? I mean, I was cautiously optimistic about the North Korea summit. A lot of the verdict is still out on that. But this one, I'm not so optimistic. I'm not really sure what we're going to accomplish from this. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that in just a sec. Uh, We have Paul producing today. You heard his voice earlier. And Stephanie screening your calls at 407-916-5400. You can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. It is 608 here on Good Morning Orlando. So Putin has just landed in Helsinki. He's set to meet with Trump pretty much in a matter of minutes. Um, There's... A little confusion on whether the press conference between the two of them is going to be before the meeting or after the meeting. Uh, We'll cover it as much as we can here on Good Morning Orlando. So, as I said earlier, when it came to the North Korean summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore, I was cautiously optimistic about that. Now, it seems like North Korea is still not doing what they should be doing. I still think there's some internal divisions in that country, and that could be a big reason why that's happening. There, I still think there's a possibility that Kim Jong-un really wants change. But when it comes to this summit between Trump and Putin, I'm not really sure what the goal is. When it came to the North Korea summit, there was a, there was a goal. There was a specific goal that was to be reached, and that was denuclearization of the peninsula. Here, I'm not really sure, other than, you know, they just kind of want to get along. I'm not really optimistic that anything huge is going to come from this summit. I have no doubt that President Trump will tout it as a success, but I'm not sure anything really big is going to come out of it. That's not really a huge criticism of Trump or anything. I just don't think Putin really wants to change. I don't think he wants to change anything. I think he has his goals and he's going to continue his goals until someone forcibly stops him from doing it. So when it comes to this summit, I'm not against it. I think it's fine that they're meeting. Trump has already met with him. Other presidents have met with Putin as well, but I'm not really sure if anything big is going to come out of it. Do you disagree with me? 407-916-5400. You can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. One of the reasons I'm saying this is, is because President Trump himself has kind of downplayed it a little bit. And a good example is what he said on CBS in an interview uh, over the weekend. This is what he said about, is he optimistic about the summit? Here it is. 
I don't expect anything. I frankly don't expect. I go in with very low expectations. I think that uh, getting along with Russia is a good thing, but it's possible we won't. So when the president says, I don't really expect anything, it's hard for me to get really excited about it because he doesn't sound really excited about it. Like I said, I'm not against the summit. I think it's fine that they're meeting, but I'm just not sure what the goal is. Now, we also had on Friday, as I mentioned earlier, we had that indictment of the 12 Russian intelligence officers who were trying to hack into the DNC, trying to hack into Hillary Clinton's emails and all that stuff and actually succeeded. And Trump was asked if he was going to confront Putin on meddling in our elections. He was asked this during a press conference with Theresa May. And this was his response to that. Here it is. Play cut two for me, Paul. You'll ask, uh, will we be talking about meddling? And uh, I will absolutely bring that up. I don't think you'll have any, uh, gee, I did it, I did it, you got me. There won't be a Perry Mason here, I don't think. But you never know what happens, right? But I will absolutely firmly ask the question. So I think it's fine that he'll firmly ask the question. I think he's right. I think Trump's exactly right. If he asks the question, Putin's going to just deny it. I don't think he's going to all of a sudden admit to it and say, I'm going to change now. So... You know, I'll ask the question, but I don't think much is going to even come of that because Putin is continuously denying it. So I'm not really sure what the overall goal here is of this summit, other than just being kind of nice to a country Trump wants to be nice to. Now, some of the Democrats have come out and they said that after this uh, indictment of the 12 Russians, that Trump should have canceled this summit and that he should have just came home. In fact, Democrat Mark Warner, who was a senator on the Senate Intelligence Committee, said just as much. Go ahead and play that cut for me, Paul. He should not meet with Vladimir Putin one-on-one. There needs to be other Americans in the room to make sure we know what really happens. He needs to make sure as well, if he and his team are not willing to make the facts of this indictment a top priority of the meeting with Putin, then he needs to cancel the uh, the Helsinki, Helsinki summit. Now, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi were also saying that he should cancel the summit. John McCain was saying that if he's not going to be stronger against Putin, that he should cancel the summit. It's too late for that. The summit's already going to happen. I I don't necessarily think he should cancel the summit. I think it's fine that he's meeting with Putin. Other presidents have met with Putin. I know things are a little bit worse right now, but I think it's fine. If maybe something good can come out of it, that that would be great. But I'm just not sure what the overall goal here is. Is And I want I, I really want your take on this. I want you to tell me, do you have high expectations? Do you think something good is going to come out of it? Or is it just going to be, well, we got together, we meet, we're friendlier now, and that's it. 407-916-5400. You can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. So we had that indictment of the 12 Russian intelligence officers for hacking into our elections and all of that. My question is, did we really need a special counsel to do all this? We'll have that in Orlando's news, weather, and traffic in just two minutes. News Radio 1025 WFLA. So that was the big story on Friday, uh, the fact that those Russian intelligence officers were indicted. I find the timing very interesting that Rod Rosenstein decided to announce that on Friday, right before Trump is set to meet with Putin. There could be a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons might be because they want to pressure Trump to say something to Putin about it. Um, we'll see that happens. You see if that happens. Why but do I, you think he hasn't? Why do you think instead of asking him, we all know if you ask him, he's going to say, no, I didn't do it. But why do you think he hasn't come out and had a more strong presence on that? I don't know. Maybe because he wants to be friendly with Russia. I mean, that seems to be what he wants. It's what he said over and over again. He wants to be friends with Russia. So that's very interesting. We'll see what happens. I did read a report from Axios that he was outraged when Russia released yeah, that video that. Yeah. of the missiles that looked like they were about to hit, you know, us here in Orlando. <laughs> Basically, they were <laughs> headed right towards us. Um, he apparently was really upset at that. So he's been outraged at Russia before. Um, but for some reason, he wants to be really friendly with Putin. But back to this indictment, I found some interesting cuts from Alan Dershowitz, who um, I think is a voice of reason when it comes to the special counsel and all that. And he brought up an interesting point to me. And actually, let's just go ahead and play it. Let's go ahead and play Alan Dershowitz. This is from Friday, him reacting to those indictments of those Russian intelligence officers. Here it is. Well, you know, it proves, this indictment proves that we never needed a special counsel. 
This indictment could have been brought by ordinary prosecutors, ordinary FBI agents. There's no conflict here. It's Russians they're going after. There's no president. There's no people around the president. There's no conflict between the attorney general, the deputy attorney general, and Americans. It's all Russians. Why do we need to spend 20, 30, 40 million dollars, have special counsel appointed to do a routine national security investigation? All right. And so if we're not going to have a special counsel, what does Alan Dershowitz actually want instead of a special counsel? Well, he actually answered that question. He has an idea of what we should have done in the first place. This is what he said. And, you know, that's why I called for an independent, nonpartisan commission to investigate the whole election, because Mueller is not going to look into this because it's not a crime. And the congressional committees are going to bicker against each other, Republicans, Democrats, there's Republican truth, there's Democrat truth. If you had a nonpartisan expert commission, there'd be real truth. And that's what the American public is entitled to, to find out what actually happened in this election. And see, the reason why I like those cuts and I like what Alan Dershowitz had to say is because I feel like that is what the special counsel really has been all about when it comes to this whole investigation. You have the Republican truths, you have the Democrat truths, and what the American people really want and what the American people really should want and should find out about is what actually happened. When I was watching that uh, hearing of them interviewing Peter Strzok, the FBI agent, All I could think about was, I don't think either side really wants to find the truth. I think both sides want to use this for their political advantage. The whole reason we have the special counsel in the first place is because Democrats were were screaming for it. Because they didn't trust Trump. They didn't like Trump. We need a special counsel because Trump is involved. So finally, Rod Rosenstein, after Jeff Sessions recused himself put forward this special counsel and all this has done is increase the political partisanship. And I feel like no one is really focused on what we should be focused on. And that's what Russia is up to. That's what Russia is doing to us. And I feel like both sides are guilty of this. Both sides have their theories on collusion. And I'm like, while we're fighting and bickering over that, what about what Russia is doing to us? Still doing Yeah, still doing. It hasn't stopped. I mean, the Homeland Security came out last week and said just as much that they're still trying to do it. They're still trying to hack into everything we're doing. They're still trying to meddle in our elections. So that's my take on that. I want to I'm going to get into more detail on that as well. I heard some cuts from Rand Paul over the weekend, and I thought he was a really good voice of reason on that whole issue. And we'll get to that in the next half hour of course we have deborah roberts who's going to come in with me she's going to talk about the trump putin meeting she also has a story on a melee that erupted at a juvenile detention facility i'm not really sure what that's all about so we'll find out the latest from deborah roberts it's 629 here on good morning orlando So Deborah Roberts is in me in here, the studio with me this morning. Oh, don't worry about it. It's Monday. And she's been keeping track of what's going on in Helsinki, all the way in Finland between Trump and Putin, because they have that summit today. So what's the latest on that, Deb? Well, they're getting ready to sit down for those talks today in Helsinki, Mike. The summit comes just days after a dozen Russian intelligence agents were indicted for trying to influence the presidential election by hacking the DNC and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. National Security Advisor John Bolton said yesterday, though, that the president will not ask Putin to extradite the indicted Russians because the U.S. and Russia do not have an extradition treaty. Yeah, I thought that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I thought that interview was really interesting with John Bolton because I did not know that. I did not know that we did not have an extradition treaty with Russia. I figured we wouldn't because we don't have a good relationship with them. Yeah, I thought after the Cold War, maybe... It would have been different, but I, but I guess not. So that does throw a wrench in things. It does, but who knows? Maybe the president could walk away with an extradition treaty. You know, if that happened, that would be a big win for Trump today. That really would. I have not heard talk of that. And so I'm I wouldn't not sure. expect it. <laughs> yeah, but that would be a huge win. It would. It would be a huge win. He is, however, expected to talk to him about the indictments. Right. This news brought to you by Trusco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. In the meantime, the Trump administration is out with a new plan for reuniting older immigrant children who were separated from their parents. In the updated plan, the administration explained that they won't rely only on DNA tests to verify parentage. That's due in part to the fact that these children are older and can communicate more reliably with workers who are trying to reunite them with their parents. The administration faces a July 26 deadline to reunite thousands 
of older children with their parents. In local news, nine teenagers are facing charges and two staff members are nursing minor injuries after a melee at a Volusia County Juvenile Detention Center. The Sheriff's Office says inmates at the facility in Daytona Beach took cell keys from a staff member, pulled TVs off walls, and refused to return to their cells in a disturbance that lasted a half hour on Sunday. Nine juveniles ranging in age from 13 to 18 are charged with inciting a riot and resisting arrest. Six are also charged with battery on staff members, and one of those six is charged with strong-arm robbery for taking the keys. Alan Spector, News Radio 1025, WFLA. And the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota, is urging a city council candidate to drop out of the race after he posted a topless picture of his estranged wife on his campaign website. Mayor Melvin Carter has asked uh, David Martinez to immediately drop out of the race. On Saturday, Martinez reportedly posted the topless picture of his estranged wife in response to being served a restraining order. Also details their marital strife on his campaign blog. Martinez is accused of domestic abuse. He's also been asked to leave a library recently in the Twin Cities and was kicked out of a Twins game because of uh, disruptive behavior. All right. Okay. I've never heard of a campaign doing that. Not on your own. Yeah. <laughs> you think your uh, your opponent would do that, but not yourself. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it's a whole new world. <laughs> you can get these stories and more at 1025wfla.com. The first hour of Good Morning Orlando with Yaffe continues now with Gina Cervetti and the Bloomberg Business Report. Yes, yeah, so we are talking with Gina Cervetti in the Bloomberg Newsroom in New York City. Good morning, Gina. How are you? Good morning, Michael. I'm well. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. So how are the stocks doing this morning? Well, right now, the stock futures are little changed as we kick off a brand new week. We have earnings that uh, will get into high gear here. That's what investors are kind of waiting to see. The results today will come from Netflix and also from Bank of America. We also have June retail sales numbers ahead to watch for today. Stocks did edge higher on Friday. The broader U.S. equity market up a tenth of a percent for the week, up one and a half percent. The Bloomberg Orlando index up two tenths percent, led by the theme parks last Friday. For all of last week, the local index was up about one percent. So it was big news last week that Papa John's founder, the pizza company, he resigned because he had said a racial slur in a meeting. And you have a story about how there's more fallout from Mm -hmm. all of that controversy. Yeah, the board at the company is further distancing the pizza chain from the outspoken founder. His name is John Schnatter for using a racial slur, as you pointed out, agreeing to review all ties to Schnatter, evicting him from the Louisville headquarters of the chain and also removing him from all marketing materials going forward. The 56-year-old acknowledged using the slur, as you pointed out, while saying it was in the context of a training exercise. All right, and for those who love shopping online, and I know people like that, Amazon Prime Day is today, and how? what kind of sales are they expecting today? Big sales. <laughs> the best yet. This is the fourth annual Prime Day, and a company called Corsight Research is expecting to see sales of $3.4 billion. Again, that would be the best one yet. This year's Prime Day is actually a bit longer than an actual day. It runs 36 hours. It's a day of sales and promotions for subscribers to the online retail giant's Prime service. Other retailers have reacted here this time as well. Target, for example, is running a flash sale tomorrow, offering customers who spend $100 or more a free six-month membership for same-day delivery. And the Prime Day kicks off at 3 o'clock this afternoon. And anyone who knows me knows that I love pork chops. One of my favorite foods is pork chops. And bacon's in there, too. Bacon is pretty good. And because of that, you actually have some good news for people like me who love pork. That's right. You're going to love this news. Pork production is poised for an all-time high this year. Output is forecast to surge again in 2019. And this supply boom comes as the tariffs from China and Mexico threaten to curb export demand. But... That's leaving Americans with a mountain of cheap meat. Retail bacon prices are down in the past 12 months. Hog futures trading near their lowest for this time of year, going all the way back to 2002. So, Mike, it looks pretty good for someone like you. (laughs) All right, more pork chops and bacon for me. (laughs) There you go. All right, Gina Cervetti, thank you so much giving us uh, the Bloomberg Business Report, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. 
All right. Take care. So when it comes to uh, this indictment of the Russian intelligence officers, when it comes to this meeting with Putin and Trump, I want to play a voice of reason on this. Rand Paul was on State of the Union over the weekend on CNN, and he made some really interesting comments. And I think I agree with them. So we'll get to that. And we have Orlando's news, weather and traffic in just two minutes. News Radio 1025 WFLA. Here is one of the top stories we're looking at for you this morning. So yesterday, Trump put out an interesting tweet about this summit with Vladimir Putin. It's actually uh, pretty funny. He said, heading to Helsinki, Finland, looking forward to meeting with President Putin tomorrow. Unfortunately, no matter how well I do at the summit, if I was given the great city of Moscow as retribution for all of the sins and evils committed by Russia over the years, I would return to criticism that it wasn't good enough. I should have gotten St. Petersburg in addition. Much of our news media is indeed the enemy of the people and all the Dems know how to do is resist and obstruct. Updates on our top stories every 10 minutes here on Good Morning Orlando. News, weather, traffic. This is Good Morning Orlando on News Radio 1025. All I know is I don't really want Moscow. I was going to say, St. Petersburg is a prettier city. Yeah, I I would rather have St. Petersburg, but I don't really want either of them. It's it's cold there, especially in (laughs) Moscow. Forget that. They they can keep that. Spoken like a Floridian. (laughs) Yes, exactly right. All right, let's take some calls here real quick. We've been talking about the summit between Trump and Putin, which is about to happen in Helsinki at any moment. Uh, Let's take a call here from Joe in Titusville. Joe, what's your take on all this? Yeah, well, I I think after the England thing, uh, Trump needs to show a little bit of backbone because he couldn't back up fast enough for Theresa May. Now, uh, what do you what do you mean? He, back? You mean you know, because he he gave that interview with that with the Sun newspaper over there where he criticized Theresa May, and you're saying once he was in the press conference, he kind of backed away from that. Yeah, did you hear that press yeah. conference where he degrees of greatness or so whatever? So you actually uh, think he should have just stuck to his guns and stayed talking tough with her? Well, if he's going to talk tough, then when you're face-to-face, you need to talk tough. Okay. But it's more important on the Putin thing. It's a win for him if he plays it correctly. Oh. Uh, all he's got to do is is bring up Putin's statements that, he needed proof, and he didn't do it. So you obviously were not going to get military people from Russia. That's not going to happen. But you want to leave him an out so you can use his statements and say, well, here's the proof. And obviously you must have a rogue portion of your intelligence community doing things that you don't know about. That leaves them an opportunity to investigate it himself and say faith, mm, I guess you're not, you're not really <laughs> confronting them too much at the moment, but at least you said something. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, Joe, I appreciate your call. Um, I mean, I'm sure Putin knows about it, frankly. He's not going to admit it, but I'm sure he knows about it. Uh, let's go to Mike in Melbourne. Mike, what's your take on all this? My take is um, I think we have short memories because mm-hmm. it wasn't that long ago that uh, on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's re-election campaign, the United States was trying to undermine that because he wasn't friendly to Obama's policies. Mm-hmm. So we were involved in that. The At least Obama's government was involved in uh, trying to defeat Netanyahu. And the Russians are doing the same thing. I don't know why. And we were involved everyone... in uh, Ukraine or something, something like that. I have to look that up. There was there something we were doing in Ukraine as well, but go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, and... All of this Russian interference happened in 2016 under Obama, and mm-hmm. I believe his response, if I, my old memory serves me correctly, he said, quote, knock it off, cut it out. Yeah, that and he um, also uh, got rid of some Russian it. diplomats. That's he- right. That was, there was not much of a response there. But my big point is the Americans did the same thing in Israel. It's very well reported. And all the Israeli media that so, the United States spent tax, tax, taxpayer dollars trying to defeat Netanyahu. What's the difference? 
So, so you basically think we shouldn't be as mad at Russia for what they're doing because we do well, the same thing? Is that basically what you're well, saying? I think we no. I think we should, uh, you know, establish some kind of ground rules on that. But let's not be outraged when the United States did the same thing under Obama. Okay, we did the exact same thing. All right, Mike. I appreciate your call. I'm actually glad you brought that up because you're not the only one saying that. Rand Paul kind of said something similar over the weekend, and I actually thought he made some really good points. And we're going to play that next, and we have Orlando's news, weather, and traffic in just two minutes. News Radio 1025 WFO. And this is Good Morning Orlando here on News Radio 1025 WFLA from the Front Gate Realty Studio from your cell, pound uh, dial pound 250 keyword real estate so we've been talking a lot about uh, the trump putin summit we've been talking a lot about these russian officers who are hacking into the clinton emails who are hacking into the dnc servers and i happened to catch this cut from Rand paul now we had a caller and a texter bring this up as well that the u.s has meddled in elections in the past as well so why are we so outraged at what Russia is doing? And I thought it's interesting people were bringing that up because Rand Paul also brought that up, and he had some interesting things to say about it. So go ahead and play cut one of Rand Paul on CNN over the weekend. I think really we we mistake our response if we think it's about accountability from the Russians. They're another country. They're going to spy on us. They do spy on us. They're going to interfere in our elections. We also do the same. Uh, Dove Levin at Carnegie Mellon studied this over about a 50-year period in the last century and found 81 times that the U.S. interfered in other countries' elections. So we all do it. What we need to do is make sure our electoral process is protected. And I think because this has gotten partisan and it's all about partisan politics, we've forgotten that really the most important thing is the integrity of our election. And there are things we can do and things that I've advocated. So I could not agree with Rand Paul more. I think he is right on the money with this. He's trying to get us to focus on what we really should be focused on, which is protecting our electoral process. He's kind of saying, look, the Russians are doing this. The Russians are going to continue to do this no matter what we say to them. They're going to continue to do this. So how about we actually focus on protecting ourselves against the cyber attacks? Because spying goes on, cyber attacks go on, and instead of being outraged at what Trump said, let's focus on actually protecting ourselves. And he expanded on this point more as well. Go ahead and play cut two for me, uh, Paul. I think we have to protect ourselves. So because we waste time saying, well, Putin needs to admit this and apologize, he's not going to admit that he did it. And we can't take with uh, on face value anything they tell us. We have to assume, and if we have proof that they did it, which it sounds like we did, we should now spend our time protecting ourselves instead of sort of having this witch hunt on the president. If the president was involved, by all means, put the information forward. There is no evidence so far of the president's involvement at all in this. So I think we need to be done with this so we can start actually protecting our elections from foreign countries. So I could not agree with him more. My biggest frustration about everything that is going on, and I said this earlier in the show, but everything that has gone on with these investigations, with what's going on with Putin, with what's going on with Russia, is I feel like both sides have been using this for partisan politics and trying to hurt President Trump or trying to hurt Obama or we're just trying to hurt each other and grandstand instead of really focusing on what matters. And that's actually protecting our electoral process. And let's actually get that done. And Rand Paul actually had some ideas that he has put forward on how we could do that. There are different ways that we can do that, that we can protect our process, but we're so focused on the politics of it. And I really believe that's what most of this is. I believe most of this is a shouting match to win elections because both sides believe that this is a winning issue for them they believe it will help them in the midterms they will believe they believe it will help them in 2020 it's where we are now we're politically polarized and instead we should be focused on our national security so and and rain paul was right look the russians are not going to admit it they're not going to extradite these russian officials i think we should talk tough against putin I, you know, don't misunderstand me. I think we actually should definitely talk tough against Putin. And I'm going to talk more about some things that we should say in the next half hour. 
But I think Rand Paul is kind of right where it's like we shouldn't really expect too much to change with them. Instead, we should protect ourselves. So I thought that was very interesting by him. All right, Deborah Roberts is coming in. She's going to have the latest news. She's going to have the latest on the Trump-Putin meeting. I just saw Trump on the video screen walk into the presidential palace. We'll have the latest on that. And also, Deb has a story on CVS who is apologizing after a Chicago manager calls police on a black woman. It's 6.58 here on Good Morning Orlando. Good Monday morning here on the 50,000-watt front porch where we update Orlando's news, weather, and traffic here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. Then one in for Bud, this is Yaffe. And I'm Deborah Roberts. And our top stories this morning, the Trump-Putin meeting is taking place today. And CBS apologizes after a Chicago manager calls police on a black woman. We'll have the details coming up in one minute. So one of the questions that a lot of people had about this Trump-Putin summit is, will Trump recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea? I think that would be a huge mistake, and we'll talk about that next. And good Monday morning at 7.02 on News Radio 1025. With the eyes of the world on them, President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin will meet for talks in Helsinki, Finland. It follows word of new indictments in the Russia probe. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein said he briefed the president about the pending indictments before Trump went to Europe last week, where he defended his upcoming meeting with Putin and called the Russia probe a witch hunt. Rosenstein said a dozen Russian intelligence agents stand accused of trying to influence the presidential election. They're believed to have hacked the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. This news brought to you by Tresco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. Yeah, and I just saw on the screen that Trump has arrived at the presidential palace there in Finland. So it looks like the summit's about to start. Yeah, and we're still waiting for word if they're going to start the summit with a joint press conference or if that is going to take place after the two meet. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah, we will. In other news, the founder of Papa John's is defending his use of a racial slur in a conference call. John Schnatter says he was conducting a training exercise when he admittedly used the N-word as an example of how not to behave. Schnatter told WLKY that his marketing agency tried to blackmail him for $6 million before leaking the call. Executives at Papa John's are working to rebrand the company's image and advertisements without Schnatter's face. Yeah, and just just to note that he did not, you know, it's not like he was calling anyone the the N-word or anything. He was kind of quoting someone else using it and saying we should not be like that. So it does change things a little bit. Yeah, and it would be interesting they should release the whole call. Doesn't change it that much, though. Okay. You just think because you used Just a word you don't use. You didn't use it to describe what he said. Context doesn't matter. No, not that context doesn't matter. As you didn't use it to describe what he said... He should Why? Because I would lose because I would lose my FCC license. But, but I do believe that context. Regular, but you would in regular conversation. Unfortunately, no, because of where we are in today's world. But I think context does matter, and that's what he should recognize too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> are you boys done now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Chicago Police Department is releasing the body cam footage of an officer involved shooting that left a man dead in a press conference yesterday. Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson said the department is releasing the video in the interest of transparency and to dispel inaccurate information. There were violent protests, though, over the weekend after officers fatally shot 37-year-old Harith Augustus during a confrontation in South Shores, Illinois. Johnson is urging the public to let the facts guide their decision about the situation, not emotions or political pressure. Back into Sunshine State, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is investigating an officer-involved shooting in Broward County. Lauder Hill police say one of their officers shot a man fleeing after an attempted holdup at a gas station in Sunrise yesterday morning. The suspect was shot when he was tracked down in an alley behind a strip mall um, at, on West Oakland Park Boulevard. He was hospitalized in stable condition while the officer was placed on administrative leave. CVS is apologizing to a black woman after the manager, after a manager of a Chicago location, called the police on her last week. Camilla Hudson posted a video on Facebook showing Maury Matson shaking as he describes her to police on the phone Friday night at a CVS store. African American. Black. No, I'm not African American. I'm black. Black isn't a bad word. 
Hudson claims the manager called the authorities after accusing her of trying to use a fake coupon. Matson was a state delegate for President Trump during the 2016 election and is running for alderman of Chicago's 48th Ward. And finally, comedian Sasha Baron Cohen's new show, Who is America?, is airing on Showtime despite calls for it to be canceled. And he's already gotten gun rights advocates to support arming three-year-olds. The Ali G comedian has made a career out of adopting outrageous personas under the guise of filming legitimate documentaries and getting people to take the bait, including former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. Well, the show aired yesterday, and it started with an interview with Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who really seemed more uh, confused by Cohen than anything else. He also got others, including former Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott, into giving their support for Kinder Guardians, a supposed program to train toddlers how to handle firearms. Well, he's succeeded in getting a lot of attention. Yeah, getting people to talk about him. I guess that's why. I mean, you know. That's all you can say about that. <laughs> WFLA News Time at 7.07. And you can read about a Florida man arrested after a plot to burn his Jewish neighbors was discovered. He had already wow. poured eight gallons of gasoline down the trash chute from his 15th floor apartment that he was about to be evicted from. And inside his storage unit, police found 28 more containers of gasoline. Wow, I'm uh, glad they found that ahead of time. Absolutely, because they found him with two in his possession— said he was just planning a small barbecue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or a very big barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a condo-sized barbecue is really what he had planned. But yeah. you, you can get the Jeez. disturbing details for yourself at 1025WFLA.com. The second hour of Good Morning Orlando with Yaffe starts now. traffic for the best audience in talk radio. This is Good Morning Orlando on News Radio 1025. Yes, and this is Yaffe filling in for Bud. We're going to continue talking about the Trump-Putin summit. One of the questions that has been asked is whether Trump will recognize the annexation of Crimea, of Russia's annexation of Crimea. I think that would be a huge mistake, but honestly, that's kind of up in the air. There is a chance that he could um, according to Trump's own words. So we'll play what Trump said about that and more. It's Good Morning Orlando, and after a word from Deb, we have Orlando's news, weather, and traffic in just two minutes. News Radio 1025 WFLA. All right, so hopefully we'll have uh, some more from that. Um, I was watching some of the press conference, and, you know, they're asking Vladimir Putin things in Russian, so there's not too much you can get from from that, unless you know how to speak Russian. I bet some of our audience might know how to speak Russian. But one of the questions that might come up from this from this meeting is whether Trump will recognize the annexation of Crimea. Should he recognize the annexation of Crimea? I mean, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine, Putin's annexation of Crimea, that was one reason that they were kicked out of the the G8. So, but the reason I bring this up is because President Trump was asked about this on Friday during a press conference. Actually, he was asked about it last week during a press conference. And Paul, go ahead and play uh, that cut from Trump because when Trump was asked about this, if he would recognize the annexation of Crimea, he really didn't say no. This is what he said. Well, that's an interesting question, because, you know, long before I got here, President Obama allowed that to happen. Uh, That was on his watch, not on my watch. You know, people like to say, oh, Crimea. But the fact is, uh, they built bridges to Crimea. Uh, They just opened a big bridge that was started years ago. Uh, They built, I think, a submarine port, substantially added billions of dollars. Uh, So that was on Barack Obama's watch. That was not on Trump's watch. Would I have allowed it to happen? No, I would not have allowed it to happen. But he did allow it to happen. So that was his determination. What will happen with Crimea from this point on? That I can't tell you. But I'm not happy about Crimea. So Trump admits that he's not happy about it, but he really never said no. He said that's an interesting question. He kind of left the door open. He's done that with a lot of questions dealing with Russia because he's kind of just let things be up in the air. He's kind of a we'll see what happens approach. Now, the ambassador to Russia, John Huntsman, was asked about this on Fox News Sunday, and he says it's very unlikely that Trump would recognize that. Here it is. 
highly unlikely. Uh, Crimea was a violation of international law. We all recognize that. That's U.S. policy. You look at eastern Ukraine, the two so-called breakaway provinces in Donbass, violation of international law. So he says, no, it's not going to happen. It's a violation of international law. He said, well, he said very unlikely. Interesting that he used those terms, very unlikely, because even the ambassador to Russia is not completely sure what Trump's going to do. There is a chance that Trump could recognize the annexation of Crimea. I think that would be a huge mistake. Now, before I get to why, I happen to uh, catch Bill O'Reilly, used to be on Fox News, obviously. He joins Glenn Beck on Fridays, usually, on the Glenn Beck program. Now, the Glenn Beck program plays on this station, 9 to noon, Monday through Friday. He was asked about this whole issue with Crimea, and his point was kind of interesting on why, what Trump's going to do about Crimea and how it really doesn't matter if we recognize it or not. This is what O'Reilly had to say. Putin's not giving Crimea back, no matter no. what you do. All right? So it's over. It's not coming back. So the greater good is let's get something out of them that's going to prevent bloodshed and, and, you know, economic disaster for the world. Let's get something out of them and, uh, you know, work along those lines for the future. So it's greater good. They all do that. So he's basically saying, look, what Trump really wants is maybe some kind of deal because that's what Trump's all about. He's about the deal. We're going to make a deal with them. We might recognize the annexation of Crimea as long as we get something in return. I don't know. It depends. It's the greater good. And he makes the point there that, look, we're not getting, you know, they're not getting Crimea back. It's over. It's done. It's Russia's. That's it. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what we say to Putin. My question to you is, should we just recognize it then? Is that it? My biggest problem with that is not so much you know, we shouldn't recognize them, not so much so we don't get, because we Crimea is not coming back. I, I agree with O'Reilly on that. The point is about the future. If we recognize the annexation of Crimea now. That's, that's a dangerous precedent. It sets a dangerous precedent because Russia doesn't want to stop. Russia wants to continue to expand its territory. You have countries like Latvia and Estonia who are right on the border there who are very worried about what Trump's going to do in this meeting because they're worried about Trump's ne- uh, Putin's next moves. So if we recognize the annexation of Crimea by Russia, Putin's like, hey, what incentive do I have to not further expand my territory? He would have no incentive. He would have every incentive to expand his territory. That's the point. It's not necessarily to get Crimea back. It's for the future of geopolitics it's for the future of that region and it's for those countries that are on the border of russia that are very worried about what's going to happen next 407-916-5400 you can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply do you disagree with me do you think it's over doesn't really matter if trump recognizes them or not or do you think no trump should be tough on this issue and he should be tough on the issues of Russian meddling in our election. 407-916-5400. Text to 23680. It's 719 here on Good Morning Orlando. So President Trump over the weekend also did an interview with CBS News. And there was something he said that sparked some controversy and, of course, sparked outrage from the left. I don't think it deserves as much outrage as it got. But he was asked if he had any... You know, do you have any competitors or any foes? Does the U.S. have any competitors or any foes? And this is Trump's response to that. Go ahead and play Trump cut for for me, Paul. Well, I think we have a lot of foes. I think the European Union is a foe, what they do to us in trade. Now, you wouldn't think of the European Union, but they're a foe. Uh, Russia's a foe in certain respects. Uh, China's a foe uh, economically, certainly. uh, They're a foe. But that doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean anything. It means that they're competitors. They want to do well, and we want to do well. And So I thought that was a very interesting comment. A lot of people are focusing on the word foe, and that he called the EU a foe, and that how could he do that? They're not our enemy. They're our friend and all that. And really, 
he didn't necessarily say they're the enemy. When he's talking about foe, it's obvious what he was talking about there. He was talking about the trade relationship. Because remember in the question, it wasn't that are they just a foe or they're a competitor and a foe. And Trump mentioned the EU, Trump mentioned China, he mentioned other things. It's obvious to me that when Trump looks at these things, he looks at it from the perspective of a businessman. That's how he looks at it. Maybe that's not the right way to go in all these situations. Would I have used the word foe? Probably not. I think there are better words to use. Competitor maybe is fine in terms of trade. But he looks at this from the standpoint of a businessman, I think. To him, he thinks in the world of trade, he thinks we have the U.S., we have our industry, the EU has their economies, they have our industry, and because of that, they're a competitor or they're a foe. And that's how he looks at it. Now, I actually disagree with Trump a lot when he talks about trade because I don't really think the EU is a foe when it comes to trade. Just because we have a trade surplus with a country or a trade deficit from a country doesn't mean they're winning and we're losing. If we have a trade deficit with the European Union, doesn't mean we're losing. It's called trade. We buy something from them and then we get their goods from them. That's how trade works. And just because you raise tariffs here or raise tariffs there, it doesn't mean the trade deficit's going to go away here. It doesn't mean the trade deficit's going to go away there. We've raised tariffs on China and the trade deficit, our trade deficit with China has increased. One of the reasons it has increased is because we have more money to spend. The economy is doing really well right now. So our citizens, U.S. citizens, have more money to spend on Chinese goods. So that's exactly what they're doing. But when I, when I look at the outrage, because everything Trump says, everyone gets outraged at everything Trump says, I don't think it's necessarily worth all the outrage. I understand maybe he could have used his words better and maybe not used the word foe, but it was obvious when he used the word foe, he wasn't talking about militarily or anything like that. He was just talking about trade, and he looks at this from the standpoint as a businessman. For instance, when Trump has a business, when he had his business, he was competing with other businesses. When you're competing with other businesses, sometimes you have this mindset that the, the businesses you're competing with are a foe in a certain way. You know, we were talking about Papa John's earlier. Well, Papa John probably looks at Domino's pizza as kind of a foe. Maybe they wouldn't use that words, but I think that was the thinking in Trump's mind when he said those comments about the European Union. All right, Deborah Roberts is uh, about to join me in the studio. She's going to have the latest on what Trump and Putin have talked about so far in their meeting. And a Virginia man totals $300,000 car a day after buying it. That's got to hurt. It's 729 here on Good Morning Orlando. Good morning, Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Mikey (laughs) Affy. Good Monday morning. Doing a great job filling in for the Bud Man. Thank you so much. And... No shortage of news this morning, obviously, and you have all of it for us. Yeah, exactly. The latest about the summit between President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin is underway in Helsinki. It comes after a dozen Russian intelligence agents were indicted Friday for trying to meddle in the presidential election by hacking the DNC and Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. There will be another joint news conference later this morning after the two leaders meet one on one. This news brought to you by Tresco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. Yeah, I could only catch, you know, bits and pieces of that, mostly because when they asked Vladimir Putin a question, they asked it in Russian. And I I don't know. Not that fluent. (laughs) Russian dressing? Okay, I've got you. (laughs) Russian language? Need some help. Yeah. Someone else who needs some help is a Virginia man whose need for speed is unfortunately leaving him without a car. And it's so much worse than that. (laughs) A man driving a McLaren 720S was speeding in Fairfax County when he crashed the $300,000 car into a tree and totaled it only a day after buying it. Ouch. I'm not sure if his insurance had time to kick in before (laughs) 
<laughs> he wrecked a three hundred thousand dollar car. You don't think that new car replacement counts for that? I don't know if it goes all the way up to three hundred thousand dollars, but police say the driver only suffered non life threatening injuries. That's to his body. No word on what kind of injuries are suffered to his bank account. The Fairfax County Police Department posted a picture of the mangled s- car on Facebook. Yeah, you saw that. I saw the picture. It is mangled is a good word for it. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah, you wouldn't know it was a McLaren 720S no. unless somebody told you it was. <laughs> well, the post on Facebook urges drivers to slow down or, quote, it could cost you. Yeah, but you don't drive that car to slow down. That's the thing. <laughs> there are you. That's the that's. That's the paradox. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Two police officers in an Atlanta suburb are on administrative leave after their chief watched body camera video that appears to show them joking about using a coin flip app to determine whether a driver should be arrested for reckless driving. Roswell police officers Courtney Brown and Christy Wilson were involved in the traffic stop April 7th after Brown pulled over Sarah Webb, who was on her way to work. Video shows Brown arrest Webb. The officer said she was driving more than 80 miles per hour on a section of wet road that has a maximum speed of 45. Why are you looking at me, Mike? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just listening to this story. I thought it was because you've seen me or heard of me doing something (laughs) similar. uh, uh, Well, the officer estimated her speed because she didn't have a radar gun. While the officer appears to have used a coin flip in the discussion of the motorist's fate, it ultimately doesn't appear to have affected the officer's decision to arrest Webb. Still, Chief Rusty Grant said in a statement that an internal investigation is underway. Webb told CNN she spent the day in jail. CNN affiliate WSB in Atlanta reported charges against the motorist have since been dropped. They should at least let the motorist pick heads or tails <laughs> yeah, no. if, if they're going to do that. Yeah. You know, he should at least get the choice. I, you know, if you're going <laughs> to if you're going to decide by a coin yes. flip. All right. And can I get an actual coin, though, and not a coin flip app? That's the no. part that saddened me. The most. <laughs> that's the part not going to lie. I've used a coin flip app before. Have you really? N- you can just go to Google and put coin flip and they have it up there. I bet. Because I couldn't find a coin, and I wanted to flip a coin. I used it. I know. I'm such a millennial. That's exactly what Paul was thinking in there. At that point, you just choose, don't you? What? No. That... You need the coin. Come on. Come, come on, on now. Now he's just complicating things. <laughs> exactly. All right. Finally, in honor of today's summit in Helsinki, Finland, a small Finnish craft brewery is paying a humorous tribute to the Helsinki summit. RPS Brewing has issued a limited edition lager depicting cartoon U.S. and Russian presidents on its label with text for Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin saying, quote, let's settle this like adults, end quote, and, quote, making lager great again, end (laughs) quote. The beer has been in high demand since it hit shelves nationwide a few days ago, and the whole 10,000 bottle lot has since been sold out ahead of today's summit. Samples have also been delivered to the U.S. and Russian embassies in Helsinki, so the Leaders can try it for themselves because the CEO told the Associated Press on Saturday that, quote, a couple of good beers can help any negotiations, especially if followed by a visit to a Finnish sauna. Could you imagine if they came out of this meeting and they're both holding a bottle of this beer? I wouldn't be as bothered by that as if they came out of the summit holding a bottle of this Finnish beer and wearing towels after coming out of a Finnish sauna. <laughs> Hey, maybe, maybe it'll work. You maybe know, we'll get the deal we work, want. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Putin always likes to take his shirt off anyway. Yeah, so. he does. Yeah, rocking those mom <laughs> jeans. Mm. <laughs> uh, right. Can he get his waistband any higher? I, I just, I'm just wondering. He does always wear his jeans like really high. Really that's, high. It's that's, like you know they that, have t-shirts the in Russia. to cover that if you need to. There, Grandpa Putin, pull him down a little. Pull him down. Bring him back to the waist, around the belly button, I think, maybe. I think you should have went with Trump to this <laughs> summit. I think if you would, <laughs> that would have made this summit much more interesting. I would just walk up and just say, put him down by your belly button, Pooty Poot. Come on now. They don't need to be up by your chest. Oh, oh man, that would be something to watch. All right, <laughs> thanks. All right, thanks. Hey, my grandpa said to do this. Whoosh.
All right. All right. Thanks, Deb, so much. Oh, you're welcome, I guess. So <laughs> so we're having a lot of fun here, but we want you to join in on the fun as well because it's time to play the sound judgment game, the sound judgment game for a great prize. You can call 407-916-5400, 407-916-5400 for your chance to play sound judgment and win a great prize. And we have Orlando's news, weather, and traffic in just two minutes. News Radio 1025 WFLA. All right, and then it's time once again for Sound Judgment. Uh, the phones are full right now, but if someone gets a wrong answer, what you want to do is call 407-916-5400 to win a great prize. And Stephanie is in the control room, and she's going to tell you what you can win. Steph? That's right. So today we have a family four-pack of tickets to Monster Jam Triple Threat Series at the Amway Center on August 18th. Tickets are on sale now. Visit 1025wfla.com, keyword events. The Monster Jam Triple Threat Arena Tour is an entirely different format than Orlando fans have witnessed at the stadium. This upcoming tour features eight of the most talented Monster Jam drivers competing on three different vehicles during the competition. So it's a Monster Jam event. It's a little different than the event they usually have. Usually they have an event sometime in January in Camping World Stadium. But this is an event they're actually doing in the Amway Center, and it's their new Triple Threat Series. So it should be a lot of fun. I've been to Monster Jam once, and it was a lot of fun. It was actually a lot more fun than I expected. So you'll definitely want to win this prize. All right. Sound judgment question coming up. Over the weekend, France beat Croatia 4-2 to two to win the 2018 FIFA World Cup that took place in Russia. What I want you to do is listen to some sound of the final play of the match, then use your sound judgment to tell me how many World Cups has France won in its history. Here's the sound. A final whistle. France have won the World Cup. So as uh, most World Cups are, it was kind of a crazy party, especially after France had won. They had a picture of the, the French president, like, just really excited <laughs> about his country winning the World Cup, which was interesting. But their sound judgment question today. How many World Cups has France won in its history? Let's go to line two. Line two, how many World Cups have they won? Well, I'm going to take a flyer on this and just say one. One, no, but not a bad guess. Actually, not a bad guess. Let's go to line four. Line four, how many uh, how many World Cups have they won? I'm going to take a guess at four. Four, nope, not a bad guess either. It's less than four. 407 Nine one six fifty four hundred. I know we have some soccer fans out there because I posted a story on my Facebook that kind of bashed soccer, and a lot of my friends were very, very mad at me about that. So I know there's World Cup fans out there listening right now. Four zero seven nine one six fifty four hundred. Let's go to line three. Line three. How many World Cups has France won? Two. Two. That's exactly right. All right. So, what's your name and where are you calling from today? Hey, Yaffy, this is Ben in Claremont. Ben in Claremont. Are you a soccer fan, Ben? No, I just happened to catch that early this morning on, gotcha. the, on the news. And I've been trying to win this all week for my nephew and his new wife. They just I want this for a wedding present for him. Oh, great. All right, Monster Jam wedding present. So it's a little unorthodox, but honestly, I think I would love that as a wedding present. I'm not going to lie. All right, Ben from Claremont. Well, I hope they enjoy it. I mean, are are you going to go? You're not going to go then? No, but they're young rednecks from Marion County. They're going to love it. (laughs) Okay, then. Well, I (laughs) I guess you're probably right. All right, Ben from Claremont, I'll put you on hold, and you'll talk with Steph, and she'll tell you how you can get those tickets, okay? Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, hold on, Ben. Another happy contest winner on WFLA. Another happy contest winner. So I have to admit, even though this was the sound judgment question, I did not watch the World Cup. I'm sure you didn't watch a single moment <laughs> of the World Cup. Did you, Paul? I watched moments. Moments. I watched moments. You watched highlights, didn't you, afterwards? Something like that. <laughs> we're just so, we're so American. So this is what it is. I, I don't know why we care. <laughs> P- 
People care. Of course. People, they don't mm. have football. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. But I mean, more and more people I've noticed care here. In the U.S., that's what the crazy yeah, thing is. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of that is because of football as well. You know, as parents started deciding my children aren't going to play football because of concussions, and then the whole soccer revolution for yep. kids because it was easy and it was cheap and all you had to do was buy a jersey and they run around. And ooh, how <laughs> cute they are and all of that. So, Oh, so much truth in what you just said. All right, but they, they love it over there. I mean, they went crazy. They even had a band that rushed the field during the game <laughs> during That's the great. world cup which is which is just crazy all right we have the rush morning update in orlando's news weather and traffic in just two minutes news radio 1025 wfla so in the next hour we have open mind monday you can call right now on any topic of any topic of your choice 407-916-5400 and i will take the call so last week one of the big stories of the week when we talked a lot about talked about it a lot here on Good Morning Orlando, was the testimony of FBI agent Peter Strzok, who was one of the lead investigators of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump during the 2016 campaign. There was a lot of questions about bias, and it became very heated, to say the least, in, in, that, in that public hearing where Peter Strzok testified to Congress. I happened to catch this interview with Trey Gowdy, who was there at that hearing who, and who questioned Strzok. But he gave an interesting take with that whole hearing, and I have to say I cannot agree with him more on this issue. He was asked his opinion of what happened at the hearing and the Republicans kind of yelling at Strzok and accusing him of things. And this is what Trey Gowdy said. He said this on Face the Nation over the weekend. Here it is. Our private hearing was much more constructive than the public hearing. I mean, public hearings are a circus, Margaret. I mean, that's why I don't like to do them. I don't do many of them. I, I mean, they're, it's a freak show. I mean, the private interviews are much more constructive. But I would also say this. I mean, put yourself in President Trump's shoes for just a second. Jim Comey thought that impeachment was too good for you. John Brennan says you should be in the dustpin of history. Those are not insignificant people. One headed the FBI, the other headed the CIA when you were under investigation. The lead FBI agent said that you would be destabilizing for the country and promised to stop your candidacy. I just have to say, I so agree with them on these public congressional hearings. Because all it is, it turns into a circus. It turns into a freak show because all it is is politicians on both sides using the opportunity to grandstand in front of the camera. That's it. It's, but it's so, so it's so weird to hear him say that as he was being the grandmaster of the circus during the thing. Well, actually, it was more uh, Louis Gohmert who was doing a lot of that. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I I. I I just have to agree with this comment there. Well, no, I agree with this comment completely, but I guess to me as he I don't was, think Trey Gotti was grandstanding. I think he really wanted to find some answers there. He's okay. just he's just asking tough questions. Okay. But so much of it isn't even asking questions. It's just them making statements, which is just annoys me. All right, it's eight o'clock here on Good Morning Orlando. Good morning, Orlando. This is Orlando's news, weather, and traffic here on News Radio 1025 WFLA. Filling in for Bud. This is Yaffe. And I'm Deborah Roberts, and our top stories this morning. The Trump-Putin meeting is taking place at this moment, and the U.S. ambassador to Russia says Russia will answer for their actions. We'll have the details coming up in one minute. All right, you've heard my take on the Trump-Putin summit. What's yours? You can call on that or call on anything else you want to because it's Open Mind Monday, 407-916-5400. That's coming up next. And good Monday morning. It's 8.04 on News Radio 1025. The summit between President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin is underway at this hour in Helsinki. They address the media briefly before heading off to a private one on one meeting. I think we have great opportunities together as uh, two countries that, frankly, uh, we have not been getting along very well for the last number of years. I've been here not too long. But it's getting close to two years, but I think we will end up having an extraordinary relationship. 
There will be additional talks today with advisors and staffers from both sides allowed in. A joint news conference is expected before 10 a.m. Eastern Time. This news brought to you by Trusco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. It appears there's a link from Arizona to the Kremlin in the indictment of those 12 Russian intelligence officers. Twelve Russian cyber spies were indicted on Friday as part of the investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. The now unsealed documents show that the Russian nationals rented computer servers in Arizona to spy on Democrats. It was allegedly part of their effort to shape the outcome of the presidential race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Meanwhile, John Huntsman says the Russian Federation will pay for maligned actions toward the United States. Trying to influence other elections, not only our own, but uh, those in Europe, uh, tampering uh, with uh, the Brexit vote, uh, funding uh, nefarious political movements uh, within Europe. On Fox News Sunday, the U.S. ambassador to Russia also issued a direct warning, saying that if the Russian Federation interferes in the upcoming American midterm elections in November, the United States and Russia will not have much of a relationship. Here locally, U.S. Senator Bill Nelson will be in Orlando today discussing the impact of the trade war between the U.S. and its allies on local businesses. The Florida Democrat joins the, the tour of Correct Craft Boat Factory and meet with company executives. The Trump administration's new tariffs on steel and aluminum have been met with retaliatory tariffs on goods manufactured in the U.S. by countries like Canada, Mexico, and the EU. And according to a news release from Nelson's office, Correct Craft CEO Bill Yergin says the trade war could force companies like his own to raise prices on consumers and possibly lay off workers. Correct Craft. Correct Craft. Correct it Craft. Is, say Correct Craft CEO. I'm, I mean, uh, what? <laughs> it is hard to say. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Yaffe. Hey, another news, Hulk Hogan is back in wrestling's good graces. The WWE said Sunday it was lifting the legendary wrestler's suspension and reinstating him into its Hall of Fame. Hogan had been kicked to the curb in 2015 after a leaked conversation revealed him using a racial slur. In a statement, the WWE said Hogan's numerous apologies and work with children is what earned him a second chance. That means he could be back on television soon, although he didn't appear as rumored on a pay-per-view special last night. Hogan, who used the N-word in a sex tape, won a $115 million settlement against Gawker for the tape's publication, effectively shutting down that company. So Hulkamania is coming back. That's right. <laughs> right. How uh, old is he now? I, Gosh, he's got to be in his 70s, 60s? I was 60s for sure, but possibly. I mean, I don't, I'm not really Man. sure. It's worth a Google. 64. 64. 60. All right. Just a year shy of retirement, so he's coming back for just a little while longer. Ah. And finally, if you haven't heard, today is Amazon Prime Day, or otherwise known as Christmas in July for Amazon Prime members. Customers will have access to over 1 million deals. This year, the sale has been extended as well to a 36-hour period and will now reach global customers in four more countries. Now, technically, you do have to be an Amazon Prime subscriber to be able to take advantage of the deals, but... Some vendors are offering discounts to all shoppers, and there's also that loophole that allows free trial users to access the sale. So you can at least access the sale without having to pay the $99 subscription fee to become an Amazon Prime member. But they'll get so many people that will say, yeah, I'll just do the free trial. Oh, and that's then, exactly. Absolutely. And then they'll keep it. And it's like the gym membership. Yep. They wait for that first of the year when everyone signs up. Mm-hmm. And then by July, only three people are going. <laughs> WFLA News Time. It's 808. Read about a U.S. official saying Russia is still using social media to divide America at 1025WFLA.com. The third hour of Good Morning Orlando with Yaffe starts now. News, weather, traffic. This is Good Morning Orlando on News Radio 1025. Yes, and this is Yaffe filling in for Bud from the Front Gate Realty Studio. From your cell, dial pound 250, keyword real estate. It's Monday, it's 8 o'clock, so that means it's time for Open Mind Monday. You can call on the topic of your choice. Obviously, the big story of today is uh, Trump Putin meeting in Finland, meeting in Helsinki. What are they going to talk about? Will anything good come from this summit? 
I want your take. 407-916-5400. You can also text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. We have Paul producing and Stephanie screening your calls at 407-916-5400. It's 809 here on Good Morning Orlando. So before we get to your Open Mind Monday calls, there was a story that I wanted to squeeze in here and get your reaction to as well. If you want to call, you can call 407-916-5400, or you can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. So this, according to The Hill, some congressional interns said that an Uber driver refused to take them to President Trump. Trump's Washington, D.C. hotel because they had Make America Great Again hats. I have uh, the the local news report from the Fox affiliate there, Fox 5, and I'm going to play here to give you the story and give your you get your reaction from it. Here it is. What happened on Tuesday night, a group of interns held at Uber near George Washington University. Their destination was the Trump International Hotel. But they never made it there, and here's why. The interns say they were holding Make America Great Again hats, and when the driver saw that, he refused to take them to the hotel. Matthew Handy says he and his fellow interns were not being obnoxious or pushy. All they were doing was holding hats in their hands. Handy says the driver then questioned the group. And he's like, is that a Make America Great Again hat? We're like, uh, yes, sir, it is. He says, well, I can't do this ride. But we want him fired. That's the first thing. We want an apology from Uber. We also want a statement, you know, acknowledging that he's been terminated because not only did he break Uber's laws, he broke uh, D.C. law because you cannot discriminate because of somebody's political beliefs. Uber did release a statement to Fox 5 saying, in part, we aim to provide a reliable service to everyone who uses Uber. We have reached out to both the rider and the driver and continue to look into this. Right now, we don't know if the driver still has a job with Uber. What we can tell you is that the intern who ordered the Uber was not charged when the driver refused to take the group. Is that a D.C. law? What, a D.C. law that you can't discriminate based on politics? Yeah. I believe it is. That's really interesting. Yeah, there are different laws on that on the books for different districts, different cities, different states. Well, it makes sense in D.C., yeah. So, yeah, it depends where you are, but it's also Uber's policy. So I found that very interesting. It's kind of the latest example of how our politics, our partisan politics, is bleeding over into everyday life. And I got to tell you, anyone who knows me, anyone who listens to my show, Beyond Reason Radio, this issue concerns me maybe more than any other issue other than maybe the national debt. That's probably the biggest issue right now. Because, you know, a lot of this started on social media. A lot of this partisan divide started on social media where we just started being nasty to each other and we just couldn't peacefully disagree with one another, which we need to do in order for the civil society to work, in order for the country to run. Yet now we have it where it's bleeding over from social media, bleeding over from cable TV, cable news, bleeding over from news in general and politics in general. And now it's coming in daily life where you have people who are running businesses or people working for certain businesses or people in just everyday life who will not serve you or be nasty to you because of your political beliefs. I think this is really dangerous for the future of the country. I really do. Some people might think I'm overstating that. But, I mean, it's kind of the one thing that we, can, we all still do on a daily basis. We participate in commerce. We go about our daily lives. What are we going to do as a people? What are we going to do as a nation if we can't go to certain places because of our politics? We're just going to have Republican businesses and Democrat businesses? Is that really where we want to go in this country? I'm afraid that where it's headed... And I really don't like it. I think we should just go to a business because we like the good or service they're providing. But I think what's going to happen is you're going to have a backlash on the other side. You're going to start having Trump supporters do the same thing to people on the left. That's what's going to start happening. Oh, yeah. I remember when it was happening with Black Lives Matter t-shirts. 
and people weren't being served because they were wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Yeah, so this is this is definitely a problem. I don't like where this is headed. And I think a lot of it has to do with social media and the fact that it started on social media and it started to bleed over into our everyday lives. So do we get to say social media is evil now? No. Dang. A tool is not evil in itself. It's what you do with the tool that e- that makes it evil. You're missing out on such a good chance for <laughs> hyperbole, though. Yeah, I know. 407, <laughs> if you have a take on that, you can call right now, 407-916-5400, or you can text to 23680, where standard message and data rates apply. It's 820 here on Good Morning Orlando. All right, it is time to get to those Open Mind Monday calls. If you want to call, you can call 407 916 5400 or text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply. Let's go to Justin in Lake Mary. Justin, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How's it going, Michael? Pretty good, my friend. I uh, just wanted to say thanks for taking my call. Of course. Uh, I'm calling in uh, regarding an issue that's affecting our friends and neighbors, if not ourselves directly. Um, pretty much everyone knows about autism. Uh, in, right. in this country, it's it's really come to the forefront lately. And what many people don't know is that there is an effective therapy that um, mostly children re- receive when they have been diagnosed with autism called a play, Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA therapy. Okay. And it's so effective that the courts ruled a few years ago that as long as a physician deemed it was medically necessary for their patient to receive it, they were supposed to have it covered. Um, they also ruled at that same time that ACA, which is the Agency for Healthcare Administration in Florida, um, who had previously excluded, excluded this coverage, did so under unreasonable and arbitrary grounds. They didn't even follow their own standards when they excluded it, essentially. What, what does the, fast, what, what does the treatment in, entail? You know, it's hard to, to really discuss that in depth because it is almost on a case-by-case basis. It's gotcha. very extremely data-driven, uh, but it, it if, um, the therapy is for children who, who are on the autism spectrum, but uh, beyond that as well, again, as I said, the courts have really opened that up. So children with ADHD, for instance, or Down syndrome, they're also able to receive this therapy uh, because the diagnoses essentially have been opened up to allow for it. Um, so essentially, if we fast forward past those original court cases uh, to more recently, what we're actually seeing now is that uh, ACA's actions, again, this is the Agency for Healthcare Administration that oversees it for uh, one of the programs, uh, one of the state programs, which is Medicaid. Um, and they cover about 1.7 million children in the state of Florida. And the prevalence of autism is expected to be about one in every 68 children. But currently, ACA is only uh, authorized services for about one in about 120 of their population. Um, and so what they've essentially done is they've been limiting access. And the way that they've been doing that is they've actually targeted the providers that are providing this therapy. Um, they determined there, was, there were too many providers in the network to cover uh, the recipients that have been receiving this therapy. And so they started asking for these providers to provide documentation showing that they were supposed to be approved when, uh, as a provider when ACA originally approved them. But they didn't reach out to the providers. They actually reached out to the providers' employers. um, And So it sounds like they're making it really difficult for providers to give this treatment. Exactly. Not only are they are they suspending current providers, and they have done so without actually reaching out to the specific provider in uh, in question in the first place. So essentially, what they're saying is, we didn't receive documents from an employer that you have perhaps worked with in the last year. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and suspend your your ability to provide this therapy. And they did it without reaching out to them. They just all these providers started receiving letters, and there's about a thousand of them across the state now. I mean, what's the motivation for this? Why, I mean, why limit um, care to those who really need it? From what we've been able to tell, it really is the money that's involved um, because from what we understand, the legislature actually uh, raked ACA over the coals for going over what their estimated budget was. 
Um, but what we're what we have been telling ACA from the beginning is that their estimated budget was actually very low to begin with. So they they kind of shot themselves in the foot with this, and now they're trying to roll that back in. So so was there a solution um, and, to this problem? Is there, I mean, is there a way that people can help? Is there you know a site that they can go to to help out? Or I mean, what 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 could uh, fix this problem? Well, the legislature's out of session right now, so. What we're, uh, what we're telling a lot of people is not to contact their local representative because that's not really going to get much action. You can contact the governor's office directly. Um, and if your listeners don't know, his number is 850-488-7146. And the recipients and providers of this uh, care, they know the, the number for ACA as well to reach out to them, but I can give it to your listeners. And that's 877 254 one zero five five and then there's a couple organizations in the state that are actually trying to fight against this as well one of them is faba um, and they can go to their website or contact them as well Um, i have their number i don't want to confuse everybody but i have their numbers as well if you want to give them again and then there's a national organization called autismspeaks.org is their website and they're all and they're all kind of looking into this issue and trying to make sure that those with this issue are getting the access to care that they that can really help them exactly and and what they've also done is they've limited the number of people that the number of providers that are being approved and again they're doing this kind of on an an arbitrary basis as well Um, they physically reduced the number of of staff that were approving applications and i think at present there's a little bit more than a thousand applications that are needing to be reviewed and ought to reduce their staff down to one person oh, geez. Um, in order to review these things. And then once that, that came, became known, they, they said that they were increasing it. But um, what we've heard is they've only increased it by one person. So there, there's still just two people that are reviewing these. And, and what's happening is these families are not getting their therapy that we, they were originally receiving. And new families that are trying to get therapy are not able to get it now as well because they're being waitlisted. Uh, among all the agencies in the state because they just don't have the providers. They don't have the manpower in order to service this population. All right, Justin. Well, uh, unfortunately, I'm out of time, but it's a very important issue, and uh, I hope people will look into it, and good luck to you. Hopefully that people will reach out to the governor and try to try to get this straightened out so more people uh, who are struggling with autism some way in their life can be able to get access to the care they need. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. You have a good, great day. All right. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. Deborah Roberts is in the studio with me right now. It's 832 on Good Morning Orlando. And welcome back to the 50,000 watt front porch here. Good Morning Orlando, where we're updating the latest news. And of course, the big story of the day is another summit that Trump's involved in this time with Russian President Vladimir Putin where talks are already underway between the president and Putin. They're sitting down one-on-one at the presidential palace in Helsinki, Finland, with only translators present. After that wraps up, advisors and staffers from both sides will be allowed in. A joint news conference is expected before 10 a.m. Eastern time. Meanwhile, President Trump is getting social media support from Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs on Twitter. Before his meeting with Vladimir Putin today, Trump tweeted, quote, Our relationship with Russia has never been worse thanks to many years of U.S. foolishness and stupidity and now the rigged witch hunt, end quote. That was followed by a reply from the ministry that simply stated, quote, we agree. This news brought to you by Trusco Bank, Florida's hometown bank. The suspect accused of shooting three Kansas City, Missouri police officers is dead following a standoff. Two undercover police detectives were shot outside a motel yesterday morning while following the suspect, who was considered a person of interest in the shooting death of a University of Missouri, Kansas City student earlier this month. A third Kansas City police detective was later shot during a standoff with the suspect at a home, but that suspect was shot and killed by police, and the officers are thankfully expected to recover. Closer to home, it turns out operational problems at Gulf Coast refineries are to blame for a rise in Florida gas prices over the past week. AAA says today's statewide average for a gallon of regular is $2.80. That's up $0.08. Cents. The most expensive gas price averages are found in, no, uh, no surprise here, South Florida, West Palm Beach, Boca Raton at two eighty nine dollars a gallon, Miami at two eighty four, dollars and Crestview, Fort Walton Beach at two eighty three. dollars On the low end, 
are Punta Gorda at 274 and Tallahassee and Orlando at 276 a gallon. AAA says some of the refinery issues have been resolved while others could take weeks. Uh, that was the question I was going to ask I you. Know. That's the important question. How long is it going to take to fix? It does because it didn't it seem like at one point you went to the pump and it was 268. Okay, this is yeah. doable. This is dealable, well, 265. Mm-hmm. And now it's almost 280 again. I did not realize it was a local issue. I didn't either. Nice Gulf Coast refineries. <laughs> <laughs> hey, alligator attacks have been getting a lot of attention in yeah. the media lately. We had one just last week, a mm-hmm. man trying to fish a Frisbee out of an Orange County lake, getting bit by an alligator they believe was protecting her nest. But just leave the Frisbee. Yeah, leave the Frisbee, <laughs> man. They're a buck. But officials at the Florida Wildlife Commission say your odds of being injured are really only about 3 million to 1. Still, Tammy Sapp at the FWC says there are a few simple rules for living near gators. Never feed an alligator. It's illegal, and they learn to associate people with food. We also want people, if they see an alligator, to keep their distance. Because alligators can look lethargic, but they can actually move very quickly. Yeah, and it turns out the zigzag thing they always tell you to do when you're running away from a gator, that doesn't work. That's to know old wives' tale. No, really? Yeah. I asked, actually asked a guy at the zoo who, who takes care of the alligators if that was true, and he said... He said, no, the alligator's eyes are on the side of their right. their head. That would actually help them see you better. Oh, good. <laughs> so, <laughs> Someone's so. been setting up crackers for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, no, that's not true. That was my only theory for escaping an alligator. No. Not that I they chase you too much. Well, but they could, and they can get, qu- they're quick, too. Yeah, they are fast. They are, they are very, very fast. Hey, do you know what the oldest color in the world is? Uh, the first color, the world's oldest color. The w- orange, I don't know. Wait. Nope. It's, it's much <laughs> I didn't know this was a that. thing. No, the, the world's oldest cover, color to exist or like a crayon or? Oldest color to exist. Pigment, natural. Um, Green? Nope. Turns out, thanks to work at a Tallahassee lab, we now know a bit more about the world as it existed one billion years ago. Scientists at MagLab recently discovered that there were no animals on the planet at that time. Scientists also discovered that the oldest color is pink. Really? That's and right. how did, how, what? MagLab <laughs> researcher Amy McKenna tells the Democrat the discoveries were made studying billion-year-old shale oil found in Africa. Paul Paul still doesn't understand. I, I really don't either. This is above okay. our head. This yeah, is over this is our over heads. Our pay grade. Yeah, but <laughs> but having a mag lab in Florida is a really cool thing. It's it's changing yeah. a lot of research and it's making a lot of news around the world. But I will go around telling this to people for the next week to sound <laughs> like I know something. <laughs> Just make yeah. sure you follow it up by saying, Oh yeah, well they found it because they studied billion year old shale oil that was found in Africa. Yeah. And then walk away so they exactly. don't have to explain so they didn't anymore. Ask any because <laughs> if there's a Mike Yaffe in the crowd, he's going to go, well, where exactly in Africa did they get the shale oil? <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know how that goes, how you get from shale oil to color, but okay. <laughs> Read it. Do a Google. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Yeah, do a Google. It is pretty interesting to find out that pink would be the world's oldest color. Right. You would think it would be something so much more complex or, or simple. It's just pink isn't the color I would have thought. It wasn't what I was thinking. But you can get these stories and more at 1025WFLA.com. I'm going to make way for the third hour of Good Morning Orlando, continuing now with Yaffe. Yes, and we're going to take more of your Open Mind Monday calls. We have some open lines, so call right now, 407-916-5400, Text to 23680, where standard message and data rates apply. It's 841 on Good Morning Orlando. So a little bit earlier in the hour, I was talking about how some congressional interns were refused service from an Uber driver because they had Make America Great Again hats. Well, um, I'm getting some texts on that. One person says this, says, Yaffe, you are 100% correct. This kind of stupidity will cause a civil war. People are tired of being treated like trash for no good reason. Uh, another person said this, said, let's not let political correctness mask the true culprits. Half the country truly distrusted and disapproved of Barack Obama, but you never heard or saw behavior like this. The liberal Democrats own this. So if you want to give your take on this, you can text to 23680 where standard message and data rates apply, or you can call 407 
916-901-5400. Let's take a call here. Let's go to Joe in Orlando. Joe, what's your topic for Open Mind Monday? Yeah, I wanted to discuss impeachment. And my question goes to Paul because I, I don't think he's a neocon, so he might give me a real answer. Um, you know, the Democrats say they want to impeach Trump, and I just don't know why they won't go down the road of impeaching him for bombing Syria without any congressional approval. Uh, they're obviously no threat to us. And uh, he basically just uh, insulted the uh, the whole separation of powers uh, uh, so, idea. So is your question, I mean, obviously you believe that him bombing Syria is against the law, against the Constitution, and you believe that he should be impeached for that? Yes, absolutely. And it would okay. be easy to do that. And I just don't know why the Democrats won't do it. Is I that think you Obama did the same thing. Well, I was just about to say, I think you do know why the Democrats would not do that. I mean, you really so know why, of, don't you? Well, so they're full of crap and there's really only one party is what you're saying. Well, I mean, we can get into the differences between the two parties and are they really different. But I think you hit the hit and nail on the head with the fact that the Democrats in power would have done the same thing. The Democrats don't want to say something like that's not constitutional because they believe a president should have that power as well. I mean, I know you know that. You believe that. Because you're right, Obama did the same thing. Well, I do believe that, but I I can't get people on the right and the left to admit that because obviously I'm kind of a libertarian in most situations. So uh, I, I know they're guilty of just wanting to kill Arabs because it's fun. But, no, uh, that's I not what I said. I don't think that they're guilty of wanting to kill Arabs, but they believe that a president should have that power. And within, I mean, I think the law is if it's a national security threat, the president has power, but he has to get congressional approval to go beyond so many days. Isn't that correct? Well, you would admit that there's no threat, right, uh, from Syria. I don't know if I admit there is no threat. Is there enough of a threat to bomb them without congressional approval? That's a little well, bit debatable. I think there is a threat when countries have chemical weapons. That's a threat to national security. Yeah, they still didn't find any chemical weapons. So that's, that's why. I well, now you're going down the road on whether there are chemical weapons, and that's kind of a different subject. But I appreciate your call. There are a lot of people, a lot of libertarians who believe that a president should not have been able to bomb Syria without congressional approval. In fact, Rand Paul, who I like a lot, was one of the people that brought that up. Whether that's worth impeachment, I don't think so. I don't think that even matters because the Democrats did the same thing. 407 916 5400, text to 23680 or standard message and data rates apply. It's 850 here on Good Morning Orlando. Yes, and this is Yaffe filling in for Bud. Bud will be back tomorrow. We are broadcasting from the Frontgate Realty Studio from your cell dial pound 250 keyword real estate. We're taking calls for Open Mind Monday. It's the 8 o'clock hour. It's Monday. That means you can call on any topic. And let's go to Chuck in Titusville. Chuck, what's your take on, uh, what's your topic this morning? Uh, the topics, uh, what you were just talking about with uh, Obama going into Syria. Obama uh-huh. never went into Syria and attacked Syria. He never enforced the red line. Remember, he asked Congress to vote on it, and Congress refused to vote on it. That's why Obama never went after Assad, the Assad government and only went after the terrorists because the terrorists were covered under the uh, original agreement. Well, you're right that he never went after Assad, but he did order airstrikes against ISIS in the area. Right, but that's a terrorist organization covered by the previous agreement uh, going into Syria, which was what they were debating, is that he didn't need it. And Obama said he did because he was going after the Assad government, which is a sovereign nation, which changes things. And that's why he never enforced his red line, because he never got approval. That's their story. Whether you want to believe it or not, I have no idea. But uh, it, they were two separate en- uh, events. What Trump did is went after the Assad government. Okay. What Obama did was went after terrorists. Well, the so Democrats supported Trump 
on doing that, yeah. though. I, I so. understand that. I, and, I, and it's not that I don't support them, but there is the previous caller did make a, a mistake in the fact yeah, you're that right. That's a good point. Separate entities, and you know, you can call Obama weak and call him whatever you want, but uh, that that was the story on that, and I just wanted to clear that up. Well, actually, that that's a really good point. There was a difference between uh, bombing uh, Assad's government and bombing um, and bombing ISIS. Although I'm pretty sure that Obama did other things to support uh, the groups that were against. Assad as well. So that could get a little complicated, but my main point was that both sides, and I think Joe's main point was well as well, is that both sides want the president to have that power, basically. That's why the Democrats would never impeach Trump for bombing Syria, because they know that they want their president to be able to do that as as well. So, all right, I appreciate you joining the show this morning. Bud will be back tomorrow with all the latest news. We'll see what happens with this Trump Putin summit. We'll see what they talked about. We'll see if any deals come out of it. I'm not very optimistic that too much is going to come out of it. Uh, Trump actually downplayed a lot of the optimism as well, but we'll see what happens. And Bud will have all the latest tomorrow, and I'll be here producing, and Deb will be updating the news, and I'll end the show just like Bud does. God bless you, and God bless America. Catch you next time.